All right, y'all. So this is part two of um, Miriam Kaba's um, We Do This Till We Free Us. Part one was when we did part um, one, two, three, and four. And now we're doing part five, six, and seven. And this will be the last video of um, this series. And um, this um, now we're going on to part five, which is titled We Must Practice and Experiment, Abolitionist Organizing in Theory. And the first um, article is titled Police Torture, Reparations, and Lessons in Struggle and Justice from Chicago. And this is where um, she was going through an example of an organizing um, camp movement that she did in Chicago in which she was advocating and they were they were advocating for um, the reparations for the for the survivors of the of the, um, the families that were harm, harmed by um, what's it? by um this police this police chief um John, police commander John Burge in Chicago he was a uh, um a commander who has tortured um a lot of um people in Chicago and um it, and i think it's all if it was literally if it wasn't for this the it literally only relying on the state for the solution for this um problem and that's that's also what's abolition um it goes into reparations so reparations from slavery and all that all that is interconnected with um abolition it's just that reparations from slavery isn't all it's not not in, not just reparative justice from that it's reparative justice from people that literally went through state sanctioned violence so it was a it was nice to to know that something like that actually happened in Chicago, and um, let me see if she had any um, um, things that stuck out. She literally, she, yeah, she talked about like how beautiful the community community was, like the direct action and all of that. How important all of that is in, is is in of itself. Even if you're abolitionist or not, you should know that how how beautiful it is that a community cares for a person that has been harmed. And she needs to see, and, and I think if that's like the consciousness of other communities, we will actually get to a better society. And Kappa says here, love offers the opportunity to build, sustaining, and affirming communities that can help buffer against the relentless forces of oppression seeking our daily destruction. To lead with love gives us a fighting chance at winning. And it literally takes me back to Bell Hooks all about love and how, um, not even just just love is radical it's actually radical love like love that that um that society doesn't tell you is actually love and I think that was it so that it was a short story but it, it was nice that something like that actually happened so and it was an example of healing so and healing doesn't else doesn't only have to be just meditation, um, negotiation. Sometimes it's financial support. Literally, just help me to get food on the table and stuff like that. And the next article is titled "Free Us All: Participatory Defense Campaigns as Abolitionist Organizing." So she's talking about the the movements that abolitionists have been a part of. Um, some involve some involve bail reform, so ending cash bail because sometimes sometimes you make a mistake and unfortunately you have to pay to get bailed out of prison or jail and and people are fighting to combat that. People are fighting for people to get commutated. And so that's literally just get an elected official to sign off to sign off a person to no, be no longer incarcerated and chelsea um manning was an example of that um but when we go into like someone like um mumia abu jamal who is um black panther party member and black liberationist um he's still incarcerated to this day who else um um jaleel mutakim he just got he just got released for something that he he never did and he was in in prison for decades literally like four decades like he literally had his adulthood stripped away from him and it goes into like those um examples and um she also talked about um legislation like decriminalizing um and legalizing marijuana um decriminalizing sex work um things that can be solved through legislation 
and um, actually and actually um, redistribution of wealth. And another thing is she talked about defense campaigns with abolitionist strategies and frameworks such as care work. So actually make have give more of a role for the community to be responsible for, for each other and make sure that there's protection and safety without having to relying on the police and prisons. And then, then she went into, um, yeah, she also said here, the system will never indict itself and that when we demand more prosecutions and punishment, this only serves to reinforce a system that must itself be dismantled. And then she went into Free Brescia and Free Marissa. And I went talked about Marissa Alexander um, on the previous um, part. But Brescia Meadows was um, um, some... This, this is how I first heard of Marian Kaba. There was a hashtag Free Brescia um, campaign. And then um, she was... I think she killed um, her father because her father was trying to um, rape her. And she was been incarcerated um, since then. And she also talked about Joan Little, who is um, a prisoner, who was a black woman prisoner. And she had to fight against a white um, security guard. And guess who got even more punished? Um, Joan Little. So there was a movement to free Joan Little. And that goes into how women in incarceration women in incarceration feminism can't work when women are incarcerated and then um let me see is there something else yeah she talked about the sexual and gendered violence of those that are incarcerated and let me see abolitionist organizing and practice I think she's pretty much talking about move, how how a movement is abolitionist when it actually centers those that are that went through sexual and gendered violence. So that's women and gender nonconforming people, racial um, dynamics of gender di based violence, um, and note. And this is something that I've interest that I just learned from this is that men and women used to be in the same prison. But I think reform has gotten to a place where it's now women's prisons. But because of that, it's more ways to criminalize women and put women in prison. So that goes into how we need to be we need to be skeptical about when you're pushing for reform, because if reform is actually giving more money to um the system to to be the system then you can it's really doing nothing good and the next article is titled rakia boyd and hashtag fired dante servant an abolitionist campaign in chicago so rakia boyd was um a young black woman that i didn't know that didn't i didn't hear about it until i read this who was killed by um chicago police department the um, detective dante servin and we all know the story. Um, he was um, back. He like there was a trial and everything. He wasn't. He was acquitted and got back into the. He got back into um, being a cop, and there was no accountability for it. So it goes, but there is a campaign for the hashtag Fire Dante Servant. So there was public pressure to um, to hold um the police department accountable which we all know it's nine times out of ten they'll keep the they'll keep the person just because they're like we need um safety we need another person to um keep our community safe even though we harmed our community so it's um it's a it's a frustrating thing that goes into organizing and how and how what's an abolition mindset to the fire have Dante Servin? It's most likely um, to defund the department and put it into um, whatever that community in Chicago needed. And she talk about how BYP one hundred has been involved in this project. NIA has been involved in this and. 
and hashtag say her name has been involved in this and pretty much given an eye and why we de- need to focus on um, state sanctioned violence that happens to um, black girls and women and gender nonconforming people. Because we, if we think about um, the black trans people that were incarcerated, some of them were there because of surviving um, sex work. And we know how sex work is, it's... It's like it can you can go through so much within sex work. It's harmful. It's abusive. Some some sometimes, but people need it for survival, and even that's criminalized. And it's like where can literally black trans people go? Because that's like the only industry that actually, in like there's transphobia within the industry itself, but um, that it's compared to other jobs, that's how some black trans folks had to make their living. And then, um, she was talking about, um, primarying this woman named Anita Alvarez, who is, um, was she the mayor of Chicago? But talking about, um, just getting a person who has our history of violence and primarying them and, Sometimes, sometimes electoral politics doesn't even work. But when it when you have to play your card, sometimes when it comes to abolition, but uh, if you see a candidate that actually um, sees your best interest in the heart, it's better to it's better sometimes to support that person, whether not just through voting, but actually holding that person accountable and put pressure and hold them their feet to the fire and actually get the change that need to be done. So um, yeah, she quoted Joy James, Dr. Joy James, and said, the death of women in police custody by means of law enforcement measures to discipline and punish is an issue rarely raised in feminist explorations of women and violence or masculinist explorations of racism and policing. So that pretty much gets into um, the gist of um, Kaba's, um, the the lesson that Kaba's trying to get, uh, provide in this um, section. And then the next article is titled, A Love Letter to the No, Hashtag No Cop Academy Organizers from Those of Us on the Freedom Side. For those who don't know about the the Cop Academy that was, um, that was implemented in Chicago. Um, The Cop Academy is, it's, it's literally why reform is something that you really have to really think about and challenge yourself about it. Because the Cobb Academy is supposed to be where they put all these diversity trainings and all that stuff where you're supposed to become the good cop and stuff like that. But because of that academy, it results in the gentrification of people that are low income in Chicago. So that puts homelessness, some houselessness, and that generate generates more crime and violence in the city so it's like so she was um giving kudos to the people that were organizing for hashtag no cop academy and she said here hashtag no cop academy is an abolitionist organizing campaign and through your work you've helped others understand what it means when we say that abolition is a practical organizing strategy and sometimes you're gonna have to face some losses that's literally the gist of life like you're gonna you're not gonna win everything but you just know that as long as you're fighting for the right the good and the best intentions people will be with you and you'll get the support and you'll be right. <laughs> Eventually the system will actually change sometime or there will be change. Um, she, Kaba also said, you told a story about policing as an inherently violent and death-making institution that will not be reformed by training cops better or in fancier digs. You pointed out all the resources that this cop academy will swallow up and told the city that those resources should be diverted to life-giving institutions. You asked the right questions like, why are we feeding an institution that leads to the premature death of so many black and brown people, especially young ones? So that was it. And now it's um, part six, which is titled Accountability is Not Punishment, Transforming How We Deal with Harm and Violence. So um, the first article for this is Transforming Punishment. What is accountability without punishment? And she got into um, sexual violence in this case. And she was talking about R. Kelly and how 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 can we be how it's happy to it's good to have like emotional satisfaction for something like 
R. Kelly to be, to be locked up. But what does it actually say to rape culture? Is it is it because it got because R. Kelly R. Kelly's case it got to the point where it's like so many people have let this man do what he did. No one is actually taking accountability for that, and it got to the point where even the police are aware. Um, um, politicians are aware, wealthy people are aware, the the music industry are aware, and it took, well, I would say, like twenty five plus years for something to someone to do something that this man did, and it's it's that's the sad part of all of this. Like it can't you can't even really be happy that he got locked up, and goes. And even when you get into that, the prison, the prison industrial complex in itself is something that enables sexual violence. So it's like, <laughs> it makes more sense in, in an abolitionist perspective. And he's not the only one. There's Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby. And let me see if there's anything that stuck out to me. Yeah, she says here, legal remedies such as restraining orders and criminal charges are the primary forms of redress offered to survivors of violence and harm. This limited range of remedies frequently forecloses our consideration of other possible ways to address sexual harm. Abolition is the praxis that gives us room for new visions and allows us to write new stories together. So an idea that until abolishment of abolitionist approaches can meet people's idealized version of an appropriate response, prison is the best solution is, at best, a failure of imagination and a manifestation of blinkered thinking. So if you're like literally thinking, prison, 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 put that person in prison, you're like limiting yourself. You're like limiting your vision of a better world that can actually handle harm and issues that are um detrimental that are that are detrimental to the system and that was it for that article and the next article is is titled the practices we need hashtag me too and, and transformative justice and commas and this is an interview by autumn brown and adrian marie brown and Kaba says here, if we could see it as a way to understand how deeply enmeshed we are in the very systems that we're organizing to transform, then I feel like it's a movement that we will allow us to move a step toward transformation and more justice. And she also said here, you can never actually make anybody accountable. People have to be accountable. So she's talking about restorative justice and um, transformative justice um, processes and how if you're forcing someone to be accountable, that does nothing, does not really done anything to their learning, their development, and the healing of the person that was harmed, and them actually being acknowledged that they've been harmed. And Kaba says you have to remember, you have to remember the systems live within us, because like it's not just systems. With the systems is something that we're socialized to believe are the norm, or socialized to believe that's the way everything is. And if that's the thinking during like back in slavery, in the slavery times, slavery will most likely still happen today. There wouldn't be no Frederick Douglass, no Harriet Tubman, no Sojourner Truth. There would literally be. It, it might look different, but it's still the same institution that that um, funnels through um, exploitation of labor and violence. And let me see. Um, she talked about that's like the purpose of accountability processes. Sometimes it's not just for the person that's harmed. Some it's literally just to know that they that they've been hurt, and the person that has done the harm needs to acknowledge and be responsible for the care that needs to be taken care of. And let me see. And sh if you're going into accountability circles, expecting success and failure, you're not doing them right. It go Cause there's binaries to it. Like if you, that's literally white supremacy in itself, the binaries, gender binary, um, um, class binaries, um, success failure binaries, like just like people have their have their ways because su su something like success and failure, they're subjective. What's considered success and successful? What's considered a failure? And if you were going by those logics, you're not going to do get anything out of the the process. And 
she's asking us to remove things from that and know the difference between conflict resolution, interventions, support, and accountability. And knowing that all the things, these things are some, something that people probably needed, but you're not going to get that in a prison industrial complex. And let me stop here. All right. So, yeah. So Kaba says here, initially, I thought that these processes were intended for healing, but it turned out that I wasn't actually asking the people involved what their needs and wants were. And for many people, it was not actually healing. They were not trying. Their needs were not he to heal within this particular space. Their needs were to have an acknowledgement of the harm that occurred to insist that this person never do this again, to address issues around trust and figuring out how to trust people again. It was self-agency and self-accountability. There was a list of things and healing almost never came up. So that sounds a bit counterintuitive, but I realized later on why that was. And it was because people were actually understanding that to heal. They needed a different kind of space to be in. So something like transformative and restorative justice, it's, it's part of the healing process. It's not the healing process because you're going to, you go into a space where you're, you're, a lot, you're being vocal about the trauma and you're going to get traumatized again because you're literally going to see the be with a be in per, close proximity to the person that has harmed you and you have to be invulnerable in that and make sure you not you don't get harmed again and that's a challenge like you have to be willing to negotiate with that and there's no there's an and if, that doesn't make you any less human if you don't participate it in, but it's like, that's, that's how you can actually, it's, it's a, any, it's, I will say not all restorative justice and transformative processes are probably the same, are the same. It's different ways that people go about it, but if it's actually getting, actually serving you, you actually feel like it's serving you and benefiting off of this, then I feel like it's done its job. And that's literally um, what the article Moving Past Punishment is about. And yeah, Kaba says no one enters violence for the first time by committing it. That's what's deep. Cause, yeah, because you've experienced, everyone has experienced violence. Everyone probably has committed violence. It's just different degrees to it. And it depends on the degree whether we have to, what kind of accountability has to be taken kept that will actually match to the level of the harm. And it, the violence is literally ingrained in the system. Like, if I'm thinking about, in my experience, I'm a descendant of American shadow slavery. Um... I live in the... I live in the place that's Going through gentrification that people don't like to go, that, that people don't like, MPG County don't like to talk about. Um, I went to college. I have debt and stuff like that. So it's stuff like, that's violence in itself. But it can be, it's something that easily can be solved, but the system doesn't want to um, actually care for things like that. And Kaba also says here, punishment means inflicting cruelty and suffering on people. When you are expecting consequences, those can be unpleasant and uncomfortable, but they are not suffering and inflicting pain on people and you want them to suffer as a, pun as a result. And that's the thing, the difference between punishment and consequence. Punishment can look like you're not going to eat. You're not going to be in the house. You're not going to literally live. But um, consequence is like, we're acknowledging concerns. You, We acknowledge you, you're a human being and you're going to make mistakes. We're going to figure out how do we get to a path to a resolution and all of that. And that's, and um, it makes me think about like parenting style, different parenting styles and stuff like that when it comes to that. But like consequence can, looks like losing power, losing power because you take an advantage of someone using some power. And um, it can look like just drop resignation, like literally what's going on with um, Andrew Cuomo in New York. So it's um, like people are probably not going to advocate for his incarceration. They just want him to not be in a place of power because it's like you're in a public office and you're used your power for exploitation. So you should lose your platform. That's literally it's deplatforming. 
All right. So that leads us to the next article, which is titled Moving Past Punishment, which is interviewed by Ayanna Young. And this is this goes into the difference between restorative justice and transformative justice. Restorative justice, um, Kaba explained, is focused on the importance of relationships. It is focused on the importance of repair when those relationships are broken, when violations occur in our relationships. It is very much interested in community because it asks whose responsibility is it to actually meet the obligations and needs that are created through violation. It asks the community to step in fully, to be less of a bystander and more of an actor in trying to repair harm. And finally, it very much a framework and an ideology and a way of living that is interested in making sure that we remain in right relationship with each other, with the land, with the environment. So that's an expansive view of restorative justice. So restorative justice is more like how do we get the community involved in something to address harm? And transformative justice takes as a starting point the idea that what happens in our interpersonal relationships is mirrored and reinforced by the larger systems. It, if you can't think all the time about the interplay between those spheres, you end up too focused on the interpersonal and therefore you cannot transform the conditions that led to the interpersonal harm and violence that you're dealing with at the moment. So transformative justice is focused more on the conditions, like what conditions are can be placed on the society. Not more, it's not really the community, it's more like what conditions that need to be had. And, um, and, um, she also goes into how do we distance ourselves from a punitive lens. And she talks about, she says here, we spend a lot of time thinking about retribution and vengeance because that is conditioned in us both, as I mentioned, through religion and through what we grew up in the culture and through how we think about being in right relationship again with each other. And it resonated a lot with religion because it's like heaven or hell. So these binaries of heaven and hell, like you do, you're you going to hell for being bad and you're going to heaven for being a good person. But it's like, do you really know the harm that you caused that probably wouldn't allow you to go to heaven? So it goes into um, those aspects or is it or the harms that is that. Um, you've done that aren't necessarily harmful and you're not harm and you're not a harming person and it doesn't get it doesn't make you go to hell <laughs> and she also says here that's it's violence is complicated because what gets termed as violence reflects judgments and political decisions and don't get applied equally i've been thinking quite a bit about what it means to use violence and what it means to be violent a lot of times people who cause inordinate harm are not considered to be violent people, like people who are polluting our rivers through toxic waste and corporate crimes. People who are spending thousands of people off to kill other people in wars all around the world are not considered criminal. So war criminals, I'm literally thinking about every United States president <laughs> and um, those who literally own slaves. So we don't consider those crimes in American culture. So it's... um. So it's like, what about criminals? What about rapists? Literally, those get rewarded in the society we live in. And she also talked about here, and we have to govern the world from, we have, and we have to govern the world not based on just our personal desires and our personal feelings. We have to get a politic and a set of basic values that we as a society are governed by. And she also quoted a movie she said a Nicole Kidman movie, but she don't remember where Nicole Kidman said, vengeance is a lazy form of grief. And it's like, it's easy to think about the present, but we don't think about what we're actually going to do with our emotions and how we're going to use that to actually get us to a place where a person, another person doesn't have to experience that. Like your emotions are valid, but... How are you going to use where they're appropriate? And I think that's, yeah, that's it for um, that article. And then the next article is titled Justice, a short story, which um, Kaba was um, using um, a fictional story. It's given, it, was, it makes me think about um, something that maybe Octavia Butler was writing science fiction wise, because this is about a, a planet where there's no prisons and stuff like that everyone has done harm in a way where it actually 
doesn't result in the prison system. And there's this, um, and everyone is is um, politically educated. Like people are conscious about not about boundaries and respect for each other. And everyone is well resourced. Like there's free healthcare and free education. And there was this Earth visitor, and this Earth visitor is this person that is amazed that there's no prisons or something like that. Well, not amazed. They were like, this planet is bad because it doesn't have prisons. So it makes me, it's making me think about the origins of colonialism and how Europeans went to Africa because they, and, and they don't think Africans are, and think Africans are uncivilized. So that's how it got to the transatlantic slave trade and and extracting resources from Africa. And, and um, Kaba says here, um, she was using an example of of um, this character named the Cis Goose that was tried for a, for something, and all of the people in the courthouse are foxes. So it's making me think about how juries are instructed when it's something that where the defendant is probably black and the jury is most likely all white. The judge, the jury, and all of them are white, so they don't have the same experiences as the person that's a black defendant, and. She, and she says here, when all the folks in the courthouse are foxes and you are just a common goose, there isn't going to be much justice for you because y'all have different experiences and have benefited from society differently. And it goes more into it. It was, a, it was, a, it was like, it's a, it was a nice, it was a nice story that you actually get what, where she's coming from and like how it got her to... I like how she, how she got creative with it. And part seven is the last part, y'all. We're almost done. Um, it's titled, Show Up and Don't Travel Alone. We Need Each Other. And the first article is titled, Community Matters, Collectivity Matters, which is an interview of Kaba by Damon Williams and Daniel um, Kisslinger. And that... Um, that story, um, it goes into um, Kaba's expo exploration of abolition and alternatives and how abolition is literally just a praxis and a framework. It's, just, it's not just, let's take out police and prisons tomorrow. It's more, it's more complicated than that. What are we actually going to do to um, take away from this individualistic mindset that the United States um, propagates? And how do we actually turn that into something where we know um, we can't be by our, we can't live life by ourselves. We need community. We need other people with us in order to survive. Like literally think about when you got into this world and how you became an adult. There are people that fed you. There are people that cared for you. There are people that housed you. There are people that, um, that work to take care, literally just to make you survive. And, and we needed a society that understands that and actually puts in place programs and stuff like that. And um, she used a lot of examples from like Project Nia, the anti-police terror project in Oakland, um, and other um, organizations and programs that are um, abolitionist centered. And she also encourages again, abolishing the carcerality of our minds and hearts. And let me see if she, if I underlined or circled anything, but she, it's literally talking again about when um, say like um, a, something minor as like, um, like your house got broken into or something. Like maybe it's just a per person that has suffered unemployment for such a long time. They took drastic measures and decided to rob a person. So it's like Walmart, Target, and all that stuff. It could be a uh, an uh, well resourced. It could be Jeff Bezos' house. Is like you know, like it's 
like you probably just don't know, but some nine that's most likely the case on why some people resort to crime. It's literally the culture of poverty sometimes. Um, uh, I forgot who coined that, but it's a socio it's sociology in it, and and you have to re. And you have to remove um, your feelings about uh, like a robbery or something and know that a, a person probably had to do that in order to survive. Like you, it's important that sometimes you don't just you sometimes you just never know what a person is going through. That's literally what's going on. And then. And she's also talking about like the evolution of abolition and how defund the police has become a popular um, term um, last summer. And it's something that she's been doing her entire life. She's been doing this type of work since she was a teenager. And then the next, um, next story is titled Everything Worthwhile is Done with Other People, which is an interview by Eve L. Ewing, who is a Chicago educator and sociologist. And she interviewed about uh, Miriam's family upbringing. Her father was um, a known socialist and Marxist and was um, helping his friend and was um, expressing, um, has a good friendship with this person in Guinea. Um, his name is Saku. And um, and that motivated like uh, Miriam Kaba's like pan africanist um perspective um of things and and that violence isn't just in the United States but is global anti blackness is global and her mother is someone who um specializes in care so her mother's um sense of care um um uh, methods when it comes to care that helps Miriam's um politics when it comes to um um um, investment in community because her mother would take people in any type of person who so they won't have to sleep in the streets and they want to sleep especially when it's like winter and it's snowing so it's, 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 it's emphasis on how pan-africanness and anti-state anti sanctioned violence and care work how they're interconnected so i think that's it's interesting how not everyone has that upbringing but Miriam did and that was that's beautiful and that that leads into like the importance of relationship building because her siblings are so close so she's making sure her parents and her father especially instill like remember you're gonna have y'all gonna have to care for each other what will happen when me and your mom are gone like, like I'll support you to the best of, of my ability while I'm here, but make sure you're still taking being taken care of and getting help from other people when, especially when I'm no longer here. So it's the importance of of not just your siblings, but literally probably your neighbors, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, um, your friends, um, your comrades, the people you're in organizing spaces with. All of those, you should have a deep connection with those people. And then she went into like the difference between activism and organizing and like activism, it's pretty, let me see. I. Yeah, she talked about organizing first. She said organizing is both science and art. It is thinking through a vision, a strategy, and then figuring out who your targets are. It requires being focused on power and focusing on how to build power to push your issues in order to get the target to actually move in the way that you want to. And organizing is collective. You, n no individual can organize by themselves. That's literally what you're organizing. Like, what are you organizing for? It's, um, that's... And it makes you accountable to other people. But when you're an activist, most likely you're not accountable to people. You're just sign you probably just signing a petition, just a hashtag or something like that. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like you have it's the space between actually using something to make you look good, then actually caring about the people that are experiencing an issue that you were you were might you probably advocated for and you were in support of. And that goes into like um, the Black Lives Matter um, global network. Who, if y'all heard about um, Samaria Rice and um, Lisa Simpson, I think um, they they're mothers of of um, 
of um, sons who were killed by the police, like Tamir Rice and I forgot Lisa Simpson's son. But Black Lives Matter hasn't given them any compensation. Any they were they're still struggling after their sons have been murdered. But Black Lives Matter had like over ninety million dollars, and this is the national head national headquarters. It's not like the local chapters. The local chapters are actually doing the grassroots work. But the national Black Lives Matter, they have over almost a hundred million dollars, and it's like, why isn't any of those going to someone like the mothers of those who've been killed by police? And that says a lot about how activism is literally so vague. But organizers, they will not allow something like that to happen. And then is that it? Now she's talking about the possible sacrifices and the the necessity of violence and war when it comes to self-defense against state sanctioned violence. And she uses civil war as an example, literally, like civil like we wouldn't have been we wouldn't probably wouldn't be slaves right now if it wasn't for the civil war because of um because it got to a point where it's literally the United States against itself. <laughs> and it's and it shows you like how how harmful and idiotic the system is. It's like hundreds of thousands of people died for something so stupid. The civil war, like then <laughs> it's um it's wild. And it led to people like Frederick Douglass and um other abolitionists at the at the moment like to demand my humanity. Like we have to really understand how absurd all of this is and how abolition makes more sense when you think about it and then um she talk about like um i think it's like malcolm x when he said revolution mm, mm, is there's bloodshed with revolution and revolution and it doesn't and i wouldn't say it's probably like actual physical violence but it's rather it's rather redistribution of wealth battling climate injustice and actually taking care of communities and it takes a radical transformation of society in order to do all those things because the capitalist structure only considers those that own the means of production the, the elites the politicians the celebrities the rich people and and the police <laughs> and then um the people who own capital and then the next article is titled Resisting Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color, in which it pretty much helps you to understand police violence through a gendered perspective. And notice that it's not just the killing by a police officer, it's also how the state, how the court did in the um, politics of everything doesn't allow black women to, um, be, to be free. And... And Kaba says, what happens when you define policing as actually an entire system of harassment, violence, and surveillance that keeps oppressive gender and racial hierarchies in place? When that's your definition of policing, then your whole entire frame shifts. And it also forces you to stop talking about it as though it's an issue of individuals, forces you to focus on the systemic structural issues that need to be addressed in order for this to happen. So it's just something like it's a, you have to take a proactive approach. Like if you're not going to take on this issue, more things are gonna things are gonna get worse. Things are more things are gonna happen unless you don't address them. And then that's it for that article. And then the next article is titled um, "Join the Abolitionist Movement," which is an interview by Rebel Steps, and it's pretty much showing you um, the commitments it takes to be an abolitionist. Um, how do you be an abolitionist? how do you don't co-opt abolitionist abolitionism but you can advocate for like radical reforms and stuff like that you can advocate and, and be honest with yourself and abolitionism is something that you want to be educated on because it requires you so many sacrifices commitments and risk to take and then she said here it's helpful to be super curious come with what you know be willing to learn and to be willing to be transformed in the service of the work mary hook says that right 
that you have to be willing to be transformed in the service of the work and the struggle. And if you're coming to things in that way, then you know you'll be welcome. If you're not welcome, then you'll make a place for yourself when you can be welcome. So abolitionism requires that you just challenge your thoughts. You challenge everything you learn, know about the way of life and how it's literally a colonial uh, way of life. And if you understand that, you have to liberate yourself out of that box in order to fight for liberation of others in your community. And then this is the last article, y'all. So it's titled, I Must Become a Menace to My Sis- to my Enemies, The Living Legacy of June Jordan. And she's pretty much talking, it's pretty much a tribute to um, June Jordan's um, work and how she, how even June Jordan, who passed away in 2002, she understands like the system is never going to, is never meant to protect someone like her, a black queer woman. And... Cabo unquoted here, a young man who has been behind bars for most of his formative years has been told has told me on more than one occasion that he had always he was always certain his life had held that his he was always certain his life held only two viable possibilities die in the streets or die in prison. Jordan tells us most Americans have imagined that that problems affecting black life follow them pathogenic attributes of black people and not from the malfunctions of the state so it's literally like whether you go to prison or you you die that's something that's an urban culture um that's um pop that's popular when it comes to the black youth like they're either incarcerated or they're killed whether it's by a, an, another person that's in the community or the police and the state and that shows you like the box and how we need how abolition is needed in order to make sure thing people don't have to get in those type of conditions and situations in the first place and that's sad to say like and, but if we're sad to say what are we going to do to address it and confront this issue and by the way um Kaba was talking about it the alternate the alternatives and solutions that are provided we have to make it more ex- we have to make it more accessible to other communities and have more opportunities for growth learning and developing and becoming a decent human being which i know that's what everyone i'm sure wants and she said june jordan reminded us of the truth that only evil will collaborate with evil so we had to, so and 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 the friend of an enemy is also my enemy or something like that so that goes into not just the prison industrial complex, but the military industrial complex, the nonprofit industrial complex, um, the foster care system, the way education in the United States works, um, the way healthcare works in the United States. There needs to be an abolition of all of that in order for a fulfilling um, community and society in which that emphasis care, safety, love, and empathy. And that's it, y'all. Um, y'all probably see that it got sundown. <laughs> I didn't want it to be sundown when I'm finished with this, but you know, I gotta get this through before while well, Black August is happening and notice that how important it is that Miran Kaba is doing the things that she's been doing. And she always like credits other people. She doesn't even show her face sometimes when she's like getting interviewed or where she's publishing something and probably not even her website. It's because she she doesn't like to put a face to a movement because she wants to you know, people to understand that abolition is something that many many people work against. Like people, she learned all this stuff from history, from the community that she's been a part of, the 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 education that anyone can benefit off of, and. And notice that she's literally practicing what she's been preaching, but she also wants people to learn from her because she understands she has a purpose in life. <laughs> and that's that's a, that's an interesting individual that like you want you want someone like that and to ha- like the best intentions and it makes sense and you understand their thought process so. If you're interested in abolition, I think this is a good book to go with because it goes into like the the certain questions like a common person like 
would think about when they're introduced like to prison abolition and defund the police and all that stuff so all right y'all so that is it for this video make sure y'all follow my reading list at raisin souls and my personal instagram at intellectual albert and stay tuned for the next book in this series and i hope y'all take care and um have a good day all right